2024 was a forward to mass voter registration forward forward to massive political education forward forward to the Andris Tatane cleanup campaign every Saturday forward Amanda away to thank you very much fighters and commissar my task is very easy we are determined to start our lecture today political lecture that will be commanded by the deputy president commissar floyd bambu and the commissar b and the head of political education so we welcome you all commissars and we welcome all of you fighters and councillors, leadership of the PCT, RCTs, and branches. Let me take this opportunity and call for Commissar Renuelu to introduce to us the leadership. Commissar. Manta, away to forward to expropriation of land without compensation. Forward, Osa 2024, Osa, Osa 2024, Osa, Pass, Sega ANC, Pass, down with ANC, down, Thank you very much, fighters. My task is very, very simple. I'm here to introduce to you the leadership in France here, starting with the provincial secretary of the province, Jackson Malai. Followed by the provincial chair of the province, Commissar Colin Sibile. Uh, the CCT deployee, Commissar Yazin. And then the political head of Education Commissar Doctor Mbuiseni Ndos. So, our Mpokoto of our revolution the Treasurer General of the Economic Emancipation Movement, Commissar, Treasurer General. Amanda! Amanda! Ayo khole, EFF Nkangala, ayo khole. Ayo khole, EFF Etanzeni, ayo khole. I hole EFF Butavela, I hole I hole EFF Hersi Bande, I hole I hole EFF Pumalanga, I hole I hole the economy from fighters of South Africa, I hole Pans and ANC Pans, eh? Oza 2024, Oza. Hala, hala, Deputy President Floyd Shibambo, hala, hala. Thank you very much, Commissar Mamreilwe, Commissar Mbuiseni Ndlozi, 
omithiazine, PCT, RCT, uh, and ground forces of the economic freedom fighters. Fighters, you are gathered here today to receive a lecture from one of our own. The one who is second in command. Fighters, allow me to introduce to you, which is my task today, it is very simple, is to introduce to you a committed and a dedicated omissar of the revolution. A leader who always reminds us that for all decisions we participate in in the EFF, we must ask ourselves, how will this benefit our people? A commissar who is responsible for policy and research in the EFF in seeking to achieve economic freedom in our lifetime. A commissar who is overseeing governance in the EFF from parliament, provincial legislatures, and all municipal councils in South Africa. Fighters, let's all stand up and raise our second in command for Mr. Floyd Shivambo, Comrade Deputy President. Amanda. Amanda. Viva EFF, viva. Long live the EFF, long live. Forward to socialist economic freedom, forward. Forward to socialist economic freedom, forward. Amanda, away to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Treasurer General of the Economic Freedom Fighters, Commissar Opile Maute, for such a generous introduction. I uh, want to acknowledge the leadership from the Central Command Team, uh, Commissar Rene Lue Mashabela, the convener of BITLOIS here in Pumalanga, Commissar Yazini Tetane, who is a member of the Central Command Team, and Commissar Mbuyisen Nindluzi, who is the head of political education uh, and is deployed as convener of BITLOIS in Gauteng. The leadership of the province, the leadership of all regions, public representatives, but most importantly, all of us as ground forces of the EFF. So today we are going to give a political lecture on the life of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov who was born exactly 153 years ago in, on the 22nd of April, 1870. Had he lived, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov will be turning 150 years, 53 years today. And we do so here in the very important part of South Africa in the Nkangala region, in Pumalanga province, in the life of the EFF, Nkangala has been the nucleus of the EFF since its formation 10 years ago. So in 2014, when we went to elections, Nkangala contributed more than 50% of the entire votes of the province of Mpumalanga. And with continuous growth, then other regions came to catch along. But what is also very impressive about Mpumalanga Treasurer General is the fact that in 2021, we're just we're less than 1% short to reach the 20% mark in terms of the overall vote of the entire province. So in percentage terms, Mpumalanga is the best performing province in terms of percentage of the elections outcome. Because the EFF has to get above 20%, has to get above 30%, must get above 50% of the votes in Pumalanga and the entirety of South Africa. 
So that is at least a direction that we must commend. I don't think that it will be impossible for the province to achieve that moving forward. But also this region, Nkangala region and the province of Mpumalanga, are very important bases in the economy and livelihoods of the people of South Africa. So this is where base load energy, base load electricity is generated from. So this province is responsible for upward of 65% of the entire electricity that is generated in South Africa. So 65% of electricity comes from this province, from this region. Andrina Power Station is here. Kendall Power Station is here with more than 4,000 megawatts potential. Kriel Power Station is here. Litabo is here. Majuba Power Station is here. Kusile Power Station is here. Tutuka Power Station is here. So this is a very strategic province in the energy dynamics of South Africa. And we should always speak about that. And in doing so, we should reiterate what we said elsewhere, that South Africa must move away from the illusion that we can provide dependable electricity without utilization of coal as a source of power. Because there's an illusion that is going on, opportunistic illusions, that for some reason we're going to source electricity, we're going to only harvest the sun and the wind to provide sustainable electricity. It is not immediately possible. Coal will and must continue to become the source of energy. And we should defend that. Because if we were to discontinue coal, almost all these towns, inclusive of Middleburg, of Emalathene, of Ochis are going to become ghost towns. A lot of people are going to lose their jobs. A lot of livelihoods are going to be affected negatively. So we should, in principle, oppose the reckless and unjustifiable, unjustified transition, which in many instances is directed by the West. That explains why when the minister or the secretary of state responsible for finance from the colonial government of the United States of America, when she visited South Africa, she came to this region of Nkangal because they know that this is a very strategic region that is responsible for electricity and energy policy of South Africa. So we carry an obligation as revolutionaries to always defend the energy sovereignty of South Africa, we must determine and decide just what do we do with the natural resources that we have, where do we take them to, and how do we get to harvest the natural resources in a way that is going to meaningfully improve our lives. Because without electricity, we are not going to have a stable economy, even this economic freedom that we talk about will not be realized meaningfully. The massive industrialization that is mentioned in the founding manifesto of the EFF will not be realized if we do not have stable and dependable supply of electricity. We have to then clarify that. But also we must state much more clearly and cogently that as the EFF we are totally opposed to the privatization of generation of electricity anywhere in South Africa. We are not part of those who are seeking because it is now apparent and evident that ESCOM is being sabotaged by the sitting government of a former liberation movement so that they can come later and say, let us privatize all the generations of electricity. Let us privatize all the power stations. That is exactly what they did with South African Airways. They caused chaos in South African Airways and devalued it, constituted a consortium and went to buy SAA for absolutely nothing. They just gave it to themselves. That is what they want to do 
with the energy generation capacities, we should oppose that. And the only way we can achieve the opposition to privatization of energy generation is when we, as the economic freedom fighters, have sound organizational power which will give us access to mass power. And then political power, with political power, will then be able to take a decision that no to privatization. That is how we can then be able to, it starts here. And part of building sound and strong organizational power is what we learn from Vladimir Lenin. The fact that we have gathered here it's not a waste of time because we are gathered here to sharpen, to harness, to enhance our ideological tools of analysis, our understanding of just what is this revolution that we're engaged in. Because Lenin says that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Ten years ago, when the EFF was founded, we said that we are constituting a revolutionary movement, which is Marxist, Leninist, and Fanonian. So we believe in Marxism, in Leninism, and the Fanonian school of thought. So the Lenin whom we are talking about today is part, is part of the fundamental and ideological core of what guides this movement. We learned from him to say that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. But also we take an appreciation from what Karl Marx had said so much earlier that theory without practice is sterile. And practice without theory is blind. So although we're going to absorb and talk about the theoretical questions, some of the things will appear a bit difficult. But we must never be worried about that. Like Actually, when Lenin used to talk to revolutionaries, he always used to give assurance, which we're going to do now, that don't ever think that you are less of a revolutionary. Don't ever think that you are less of a fighter. If out of the engagement today, we are only going to capture one or two issues. In political education, you can't understand everything else on the same touch, on the same day. It, you learn as and when time proceeds. But also you learn better when you also try to practice what is theoretically provided as to what we seek to do. Are we together, fighters? So that is so, so don't ever be worried in terms of uh, what is expected. Because what we seek to achieve from all of us, from all of us in the EFF, is an appreciation that we are representing the working class. We are part of the class. We are part of those who do not own the means of production. And we are going to lead a revolutionary movement on behalf of the working class to overthrow capitalism. We must appreciate that. Then for us to overthrow capitalism, we should carry the capacity to articulate clearly just what are the demands of the people. So the most politically educated person is one who is able to understand the conditions of the people and is able to articulate clearly their demands and aspirations. Are we together, fighters? So if you are a counselor of the EFF, you should be knowing what is happening here in Steve Twerte municipality. You must be knowing what is the extent of poverty, what is the extent of unemployment in all the world where you come from. You must be having practical, superior alternatives and solutions to all the problems that are confronting the entire Steve Twitter municipality, Emma Lathani, Emma Kazin. 
all the areas. So if you are a, if you are, if you are leading at any level, you should have a better appreciation of just what do we seek to do differently, and what we seek to do differently must be superior, must be a superior alternative to what is pertaining now. So you can't be a revolutionary. You can't call yourself a fighter who does not have superior alternatives to what is happening now. You can't call yourself a revolutionary whilst all you are seeking to do is to substitute the ANC from power and continue doing what the ANC is doing now. You are not a revolutionary. If you just seek to, to just occupy the positions and continue giving out immoral tenders, you are not different from them. A revolutionary republic representative of the EFF would know that once you enter into that position of power, of responsibility, you must change the system. You must say that Instead of the municipality giving one person money who is going to subcontract people to clean the street and the security, let us build direct relationship with the workers. Let us abolish this middleman or middlewoman and employ people directly and change their lives much more meaningfully. That is what it's all about. And when more and more people have got meaningful income, even from the municipality directly, it means they then have the capacity to want to do many other things. They've got capacity to build their own houses. Then they employ other people as well. Then so it becomes a cycle of empowerment and like meaningful contributions to people's lives. That is why we say in the EFF that even if prior to your deployment you did not have any form of qualification or organized knowledge, when you are deployed to position of responsibility, you have got an obligation to know and understand intricately what you are expected to do. Are we together, fighters? It is counter-revolutionary to be knowledgeless in the EFF. To not know what is to be done is counter-revolution. If we were, let, let, let's maybe use a different paradigm to illustrate this, that if we were in a physical war and part of the war arsenal that we have, like the base of war machines that we have, is fighter jets, is fighter tanks, it's the machines that are going to stop the missiles coming. And then we say, we are looking for a pilot amongst us here. We must drive, or must now pilot the fighter jet to attack the enemy. And knowing that you have never been anywhere close to a fighter jet, and then you raise your hand, no, I'm available. It's... it's and, and you're going to compromise the revolution in a very huge way. Because you just say, no, I'm available for things that you know you cannot do anything about. We are now ascending into positions of government. And then a person accepts a responsibility to be in charge of the provision of water, of sanitation and electricity, but knows absolutely nothing about that. That is counter-revolution. And as the EFF, we can be part of counter-revolution in terms of uh, what is expected. So this constant sharpening of our ideological tools of analysis, this constant engagement of what we stand for, always sharpens our understanding, our levels of class consciousness our levels of understanding as to just what are we fight. And, and this, by the way, applies to all of us, all of us as leaders, as members of the EFF, perpetually. 
we must always pause to reflect on our ideological tools of analysis. We must never ever think that because we went to one or two political schools, it has ended. That class consciousness might escape you, by the way. It can just leave without even an announcement. It just leaves. It's very rude, you know, like class consciousness can be very rude. can just leave you without you being aware. And we then begin to see through mannerisms that this fighter is no longer with us. Every time there are issues that relates to the people, they are, that person, that fighter, is always looking for self-interest. Every time there's a crisis, they always check, no, how do I eat out of this crisis? How do I self-enrich out of this crisis? Against the constitution of the EFF. Against the membership declaration which we signed when we joined the EFF that I'm joining without any expectation of self-gratification and self-enrichment. So we always have to pause and reflect on the revolutionary ideals of what uh, we stand for and where we come from as the EFF. Now, the Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov that we're talking about is one who is now widely known as Lenin. So the Lenin name he got to adopt far much later. He was born on the 22nd of April 1870, in the year 1870, in a country called Russia. So he was born in Russia on the 22nd of April 1870. And he was born in a relatively middle class family. So they, they, they did not come from a family of people who were absolutely poor. They could afford this and that. They could take their children to school, to even university. His brother called Alexandra Olyanov. Yet ruling over a lot of people, more than 100 million people. People were not elected and then there was constantly resistance to the Tsar. Because that Tsar was defined by highest levels of just inward focus. Where they will be super rich, living huge expensive lives at the expense of ordinary Russian people. So from time to time, there would always be resistance to such a government. Are we still together, fighters? Then the brother, the older brother of Vladimir Ulyanov Ilyich, who was called, this brother was called Alexander Ulyanov. He was part of the protest that sought to remove the Tsar from power. And the brother of Lenin, like the, the, the presiding authorities. Suppose the system you get killed. My brother was killed because he was opposing the system. But he still remained to be a coward. I'm not going to hide somewhere and say because my brother was killed I am now going to sit back and not do anything. He got involved in revolutionary politics. He then got expelled from the university and then he was later on arrested in a country called Siberia and jailed for three years for participating in activities that sought to remove the Tsar. In the year 1898, he was then part of those who founded the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. RSDLP, the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. That, is, that was the Communist Socialist Party of Russia. Our together fighters. And within the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, there were constant engagements as to what methods do we adopt? How, what methods does the RSLDP adopt to overthrow the Tsar? 
intense ideological discussions. What methods, what kind of revolutionary theory, theory does the party adopt to overthrow the Tsar from power? And Lenin was part of those who were saying that the only way is through the Marxist route. We should appreciate that we're involved in a class struggle. We can't seek to just overthrow the Tsar to replace ourselves as some autocracy as well. We must overthrow the Tsar. The one group was called the Bolsheviks.